Today we are continuing our current sermon series entitled Freedom. Would someone just shout freedom? freedom. And in this sermon series, we've been discovering how to identify and overcome the schemes and strategies of our spiritual enemies. And family, I don't know about you, but somebody said this, and I so agree with this statement. They said, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And I, I totally agree with that statement, especially when it comes to spiritual warfare. How many realize that we are in a war? And the fact is, the more we know about the schemes and the strategies of our enemies, the better chance that we are to overcome and to defeat our enemies. Some Christians, their strategy for overcoming the enemy is kind of like to stick their head into, in, in the sand and pretend that the enemy don't exist. But that strategy will always cause you to lose. Amen? We have a very real enemy. Do you know that most people who coach sporting teams will often spend hours and hours studying their opponent's strategy by looking at and watching recording, recorded games in order to better understand the strategies and the plays on the field or on the court that, that their opponents, um, um, the, the opponents that they're playing. Now, if people can invest time studying their opponent to win a game that has no eternal consequences, then I think that you and I should be quite aware and be willing, and we should have no issue to spend time studying and understanding the enemies, which both of us know has a present and an eternal component to it. What we do and how we act and interact with our enemies today, our spiritual enemies, affects our present and it affects our eternal lives. Do you get that so far? Now that's why over these summer months, or yeah, over these summer months, I have been trying to teach you to, to see and to understand how your enemy works because as your pastor, First Lady and I, we want you to be successful and we want you to win. Anybody in this place want to win? If you want to win online, just write it in the chat, say, I want to win. Now, I, I need to say this also. I don't want you to take these teachings for granted. And I don't want you to let the enemy convince you that you've heard this stuff before so you can now just tune out because, you know, you've been around church a long time and you know a lot about spiritual warfare and you can just sleep. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. The enemy loves to trick us into believing that we don't need to hear what is being taught because you've already heard it before because he knows that if he can make you and if he can block you from hearing, this over and over he's going to come and destroy your life remember this family satan and the demonic realm is not your friend do you hear me satan and the demonic realm is not your friends and they don't want you just to have fun in fact, on the contrary, the enemy, your enemy, my enemy, wants to inflict as much physical and spiritual pain upon us and upon our family as possible, resulting in your physical and spiritual death. I know what you're thinking. I didn't come to church on a Sunday morning for you to tell me that someone's trying to kill me. But that's exactly what I'm telling you. Someone is trying to kill you. The writer of Psalms 143 and verse 3 said this. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those who's long dead. Man, that sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Everyone knows, if you've been in church, John 10.10. 10. That the thief comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Now, family, if these verses gives us an image of someone who just wants you to have fun, I would hate to see what a real enemy looks like. 
The great legendary preacher named Billy Sunday said this. He said, hell is the highest reward that the devil can offer you for being a servant of his. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. Oh, just one of us. That's two of us, me and Sister Golding. Let me say it again. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. I need to know not just how to not go to hell, but I need to know how to have a good life here on the earth. Family, if these verses gives us an image of someone who's trying to kill us, then we need to know how to defeat him. If you were in attendance last week, I started to talk you, talk to you about one of Satan's most powerful and effective weapons, which is deception. Can you say that word with me? Deception. In John chapter 8 and verse 44b, Jesus said, talking about Satan, that he was a what? Murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is what? No truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a what? For he is a, come on, it's on the screen, for he is a liar and the what? And the father's, and the father of lies. Now, I've got a question for you. I've got a question for you. How many of you, somewhere in your life, has been duped? Let me see your hand if you've, if you've ever been duped. Oh, a few of us, eh? Now, watch this. I want you to understand this. The word duped means deceived, fooled, or tricked. Now, I'm pretty sure that even those that didn't raise their hand, somewhere in your life, some point in your life, there was a person or someone, something, duped you. A little while ago, we got duped here at church. In fact, it was more Kimlin that got duped. I'm going to tell you this story. A little while ago, Kimlin, Kimlin was working downstairs with our extended hands. That's our food services. We feed a lot of people throughout the week. And she was downstairs helping out. And when she came back up into her office, she was in her office and the doorbell rang. And when the doorbell rang, she went to the door to check to see who was at the door. And it was an elderly man. He was wearing a mask and he was leaning over like this and he was like, <laughs> can't breathe. And, and Kim said, so come on in, come on in. And, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm having an asthma attack and I have no money for medication. And some of you are going to start laughing because you already know where this is going to go. And um, she, he, he couldn't breathe. And so she got him come in and said, you know, sit here for a minute. And he sat down uh, in our waiting room. Uh, and Kimlin said, just hold on a second. I'm going to go and, and talk to Bishop and we'll come right back downstairs. So she takes off of the stairs, comes into my office. She's not in my office. Ah, she's not there in two minutes. So she comes in and says, hey, Bishop, there's this person, blah, 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 comes to the door. What do you think? He, he says that he needs $18 for a, an a asthma pump. And I'm looking at Kimlin because I've been here a little longer than Kimlin. And I said, Kimlin, it's not true. And she said, what do you mean, Bessie? I said, no, no, no. If he's asking for $18 for asthma pump, it's not true. Let me go talk to him. That's about the conversation. I got up, went down the stairs. He's gone. <laughs> and Kimlin was like, Bishop, where did he go? And I'm thinking, he better not be stealing in our church. So I came out here in the sanctuary and looked around, and he wasn't there. And then it hit me. I said, Kimlin. Did you check your de desk? Did you have anything on your desk? I said, whatever was on your desk is now gone. And she comes, but she runs to her office, and she had like a pencil case with about $300 in it. And she said, Bishop, Bishop, all my money is gone. And I'm like, yes. And I'm saying all this to say, Kimlin was upset for days. She was so upset, I thought she wanted to run down the street looking for him. 
And I'm like, Kimlin, let it go. It's okay. So I'm saying all that to say, it's not fun to be duped. In fact, it really feels crummy when somebody takes advantage of you. But let me tell you something. Do you know that our enemy, that's me and you, our enemy, the devil, has duped all of us in some way, shape, or form, and what he's stolen from us is way more and worth a whole lot more than any amount of money. I know, I understand that it's hard to believe that. But I'm telling you the truth. Satan is such an expert deceiver that he can actually convince people to dance upon the brink of hell as they were on the verge of heaven. Listen to me now. The enemy has duped so many of us and he has rocked us into a deep spiritual sleep. Satan has actually convinced many of us that we're too sophisticated, too intelligent. We are too aware to believe that he exists. And if we do believe that he exists, he has very little influence over our lives. Even some of us who believe that he's real, we have a hard time understanding his schemes and his strategies. And it's sad, but do you know what else I've noticed? That many of us that are born again don't even understand the authority that we have, the power that we have as the sons and daughters of God to defeat our enemy, Satan. I believe one of the major reasons for this dilemma is the fact that the church, that means, that means me, that means you, that means the church, especially as leaders. I believe one of the major reasons for this dilemma is the fact that the church and leaders is almost completely silent com concerning spiritual warfare and about confronting and casting out demons. Now, I'm just wondering... If the reason why we're silent in the church is because teaching on spiritual warfare doesn't fill seats. Listen to me now. Our real enemy church is not the agnostic. Our real enemy is not the atheist. It is not politicians. It is not the media or organized religion. Our greatest enemy is not governments, it's not our family, it's not our boss. Our greatest enemy is spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm going to say it one more time. Our greatest enemy, I know you, you're looking at someone and you're thinking of someone and you think, man, I, I feel like killing that person. But let me tell you something, that person is not your problem. Your problem is spiritual wickedness in high places. And the Bible says this, Ephesians 6 and 12, we'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, for we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, these mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule the world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. Leave it on the screen for a moment, please. Leave it there so that people can actually see it so they know what I'm quoting. I want you to think about this. If we believe, if we know and believe that Satan is a liar, first of all, let me do a quiz. Do you believe that Satan is a liar? Come on, talk to me, RC. This is a place where you're allowed to talk to me. Do you believe that Satan is a liar? Do you believe that he is the father of lies? Do you believe that there's no truth in him? Now, if that's true, why do so many people actually fall for and believe his lies? Think about it. Jesus said that Satan is a liar and the what? Father of lies. He only speaks one language. The language of our enemy is lies. It's not French. It's not English. It's lies. 
In fact, the Bible teaches us that Satan is incapable of speaking the truth because as Jesus said, there is no truth in him. Everything about his influence is always based on deception. I was thinking about this this morning. You know, I raised two children, two girls, two absolutely amazing, beautiful girls. I mean, if there was ever a babies that were perfect, it was my two babies. Thank you, babe. And I'm sure that your babies, that what God bless you with, your babies are the most incredible and the most perfect babies that were ever born. But here's what I've learned about raising children. I never ever had to teach my children how to lie. I never had to sit them down like we had to sit them down to teach them A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I never ever taught them, we never had to teach them how to steal the cookie from the cookie jar and blame somebody else. Did you notice that? You never have to teach your children. You've got to actually, on the opposite side, you've got to raise your children. And sometimes you've got to fight hard to raise children that are actually honest. You can say amen or ouch. You, you've got to discipline your children in order for them to be honest. Dishonesty comes natural. Would, would you agree? It's okay, we're in church, but would you agree? Did any, do anybody ever, ever, you know, did you ever get stopped by the police and said, well, Lord Jesus, forgive me in advance, I'm going to lie? <laughs> no, never, never, right? No. Did, were you ever, you know, you did, 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 a, did a pretty girl that was wearing not much clothes ever go by and you looked and your wife caught you and she said, what are you looking at? You said nothing. Right? <laughs> did you ever know? Did you ever notice? You ever notice? You, you don't have to work hard. I don't even have to think about lying. Lying will just come automatically. In fact, it's the opposite. I got to think about it to make sure what I'm telling you is true. You don't like that. You don't like that. I know. I know. Now, watch. Well, here's the other thing I've noticed. I'm sure you noticed too, this too before, but maybe you never thought of it. Do you know that a thief is not as bad as a liar? Now, what I mean by that is this. I would rather have somebody in my life who is a thief than somebody who is a liar. Because watch this. If someone is a thief, I can protect my stuff by hiding my stuff, my valuables, away from the thief. But if, if you have somebody in your life who is a liar, you can't stop a liar. Because how do you lock the door on a liar? A liar, church, is way more dangerous than a thief because watch this, and we know this firsthand, if someone steals your stuff, you can just work hard and get it back. But if someone assassinates your character, you, watch this, you can even go to court and sue them for character assassination, but the damage is already done and it can never be fully undone. Let me show, can, can I show you, you want to see how Satan works? You want to see how, how deception works? I want you to go with me or look on the screen, sorry, look on the screen. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 29. And this is Jesus teaching here. Matthew 13, 24 to 29. You can put it on the screen for me, please. Thank you, thank you. Look what it says. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of God is like a man who sowed good seed, where? In his field. Stop for a moment. What did the man sow in the field? Good seed. So watch this now. We have a field, right? We have a field. Would you agree that the field represents the world and it also could include you as an individual? I'm a field. I'm a field. I'm, I'm somebody, somebody sows things in my field. It also could be in your mind. Your mind is a field. Are you following me so far? So is it okay if I can make this conclusion 
that, that, that it could be the world, it could be me in the world, and it also could be my mind. That's the feel. Are, are, do you follow me so far? Okay. Verse 25 then says this. Look at this. This is interesting. Verse 25. Come on, guys. Verse 25. Is, is the computer's frozen today. Hallelujah. Here we go. Thank you. Matthew 13, 25 says this. I underlined it for you. Can you read it with me? But while... Wait, wait, wait. But while everyone was... What was everyone doing? Mm, while they, everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and did what? Sold what? Sold, not weed. <laughs> Some of you are getting all excited. <laughs> Sold weeds among the wheat and went away. Now watch this. It's quiz time. Stay with me. Preach with me. Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? Satan, right? The enemy is Satan and the, the demonic realm. What did Satan or the enemy sow in the garden? Thank you, thank you. Weeds. So watch this. He sows weed and uh, weeds. <laughs> James, stop it. He sowed weeds among what? The wheat, and did what? He split. Now watch this. If, this is interesting. I studied it out so you don't have to. If you study it out, you will actually discover that the weeds that were sown or sowed looked like the wheat. And in fact, it looked so much like the wheat that they couldn't tell what was the wheat and what was weed until both of them matured. And what the commentary says is, when the wheat matures, it leans over, okay? But the weed stays up straight. That's how they could tell the difference between weeds and wheat. So watch this, verse 26. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds would also appear. Now watch this, verse 27. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did, I want to say the weed come from, but where did then, did the weeds come from? Now family, have you ever faced a situation and you asked, where in the world did that come from? Have you ever looked at a situation in your family, in your life, and thought, where in the name of God are you? What in the world is going on? And watch this, watch this. I'm just going to insert this here. I'm going to tell you what's going on. Can anybody relate to that first before I tell you what's going on? Have you ever been, wave at me or say amen or something, that you've looked at a situation and you thought, my good God, what happened? Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what the problem is. There is a devil loose oh yeah I, I know especially some of you watching me online you're thinking that you guys talk about the devil too much no i'm trying to inform you who your enemy is because i need you to win okay there's a devil loose and i'm telling you church we have the power through the holy spirit through the word of god and we have knowledge if we just take the time to understand if we have the time to if we take the time to study imagine imagine if i could tell you would it be worth it to come to church if i could show you from the word of god how you can win against your enemy every time come on church he says sir sir didn't you go, didn't you, didn't you uh, sow 
good seed in your field? Then he says, look at this, look at this. Then he says, where then did the weeds come from? Who's teaching this? Jesus. Where then did these weeds come from? According to Jesus, who sold the seed? Talk to me. Thank you, James. One person out of 200 got it. I said, who sold the seed? Satan. It's not, it's not a trick question, ladies and gentlemen. It's not, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Who sold the seed? Talk to me. No, you don't. Do you believe that? You, you probably still think it was your neighbor. Who sold the seed in your field? Remember I told you minutes ago what the feel is. The feel is the world. The, you're in the world, so you're a feel, and your mind is a feel. So I'm asking you this question again. Who sows the bad seed? The devil or Satan, that's right. One more time, who? Yes. Now, there's so much that we can exegese from this parable, but for the sake of time, I'm going to point out two things. Number one. Notice who it is that sows the bad seed. The enemy sold the seed. And secondly, I want you to notice the timing. The enemy sowed bad seed or the weeds that look like the wheat when everyone was what did Jesus say they were doing? Come on, talk to me. What were they doing? Look at your neighbor and say, don't sleep. Come on, you got to tell somebody else, look at your neighbor and say, don't you sleep. I know you're tired because you were stressed out and you didn't have a good night's sleep, but don't sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, don't sleep in church. Don't sleep spiritually. Now, the text is not saying that you should never sleep. But what it's teaching us is, spiritually speaking, we should not sleep spiritually. It's trying to teach us what Paul already tells us in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, when he says, don't be ignorant or unaware of the schemes and the wiles, the devices of our enemies. See, the most powerful weapon that the enemy has in his arsenal is deception. And the way the enemy sows the seed of deception in your life is when you are asleep. Spiritually. But what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, let me teach you what that means. What does it mean to be asleep spiritually? Very practical. It means... Things like, not in order, I'm just pulling them out. Things like not praying. Hello? You are sleeping spiritually when, no, 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 not when you don't pray, when you refuse to pray. You are sleeping. Oh, oh here's, here, here, I like this one, I like this one. You are sleeping when you are not active in church. It could mean, sleeping spiritually could mean that worship is only something you do, not something you are. Sleeping spiritually, is, 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 is it too much? Is it too much? Sleeping spiritually means that you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power of God. What does that mean for somebody that's maybe new? It means that you don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It could mean, it could mean what Prophet talked about a few a month or so ago, that your your oil is running low. And you're not doing anything about it. it. By the way, everybody's oil runs low. Trust me on that. 
I don't care who you admire in the body of Christ. Everybody's oil runs low. It's not the problem. It's not that your oil, your oil that represents the Holy Spirit. That's not the problem. It's not that it runs low. It's not the problem is when we don't do anything about it. Family, when you're asleep spiritually, the enemy will sow seeds of deception in your field. And when you finally wake up, let me show you what's happening. Let me show you what happens. You're asleep, he sows the seed. You wake up. The enemy is so crafty, he is so cunning. When you wake up, he will come back and convince you that the bad seed that's been sown in your field was not him, but it was God, and you believe him. Come on now. You know that every time something bad happens to us, what is the first thing that we do? What's the first thing that we ask? We ask things like, where is God? Isn't it true? Isn't it true? Here's one. Why did this happen? Why did God let this happen? Isn't it strange, church, that when something bad happens, the first thing we do is question God's goodness rather than question the enemy's badness? We say things like, we say things like, I, I'm talking church people, right? Church people. I'm, I'm talking church. I know, I know there's a lot of people that's not church, but and this is church. But we say things like, I go to church. I pray. I tithe. I serve. How can this happen to me? But seldom do we ask this question. How did Satan gain access in my life to do what it is that he's doing? See, it's easy to forget what Jesus said in John 8, when Jesus said, Satan is the father of lies, lying is his native language, and there's no truth in him. That's so, so easy. See, the truth is, we know that the devil is a liar. Uh-oh. Let me try it again. I said, we know that the devil is a liar. In fact, we know that the devil is a liar to the point that sometimes when people get on our nerves, even sometimes our husband, our wife, and we, we would say something like, the devil is a liar. I mean, in, in church, I mean, there, you, it was a few years ago, it was every, everything, the devil is a liar. And we would get up and say, come on, slap your neighbor a high five and tell the devil is a liar, right? And then we would say, come on, slap one more neighbor, somebody on your left and somebody on your right, and say, the devil is a liar, and so is his mother-in-law. <laughs> well, so we say things like that, right? We say, the devil is a liar. And I recently heard a story about a little boy who was in kindergarten and went to school. And he loved his teacher, but one day when he went to school, he had a substitute teacher. And when he saw the substitute teacher walk in the room, the little boy looked at the teacher and said, the devil is a liar. Not today, devil. Not today. <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to teach you and show you is, and the teacher obviously was very upset, but we say, we say the devil is a liar. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he's done such a great job at convincing the masses that God is the one who has sold the seed of weed to choke out the truth of the wheat. This is proven. I prove it to you from the word of God. If you go back to the garden in Genesis chapter three, verse one, where we see Satan engaging with Eve. He asked Eve a question, he says, Eve, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, do you see here, church, how Satan is trying to get Eve to question the truth of God that was already planted and growing in her mind? Eve says to the serpent, 
We may eat from the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or lest you're going to die. So this is, gets very interesting here now. Notice, oh, this is so good. Notice that Eve is able to repeat what she heard God say. Did you hear me? I said, Eve is able to repeat what God said. Most of you in this church right now, and most of you watching online, you can repeat to what God said. Which only proves one thing. If you can repeat what God said, all that proves is that you heard God speak. But just because you hear God say something does not mean, and just because you can repeat something that God says does not mean that you actually believe what God said. The Bible says, James 1.22, be you what? Doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The serpent says to Eve, come on, it's not late yet, guys. The serpent says to Eve, Eve, you won't die. For God knows when you eat, your eyes are going to come open and you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. So watch this, verse 6, very powerful. It says this. It says, The woman Eve, when she saw that the fruit was good for food and it was pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some and ate it and gave it to her husband who was with her, and he did what? Eat it it or ate it. Now watch this. I want you to see something before I let you go. The enemy, the serpent, comes in and talks to Eve where? Where are they? What's the setting? Thank you, thank you. It's the garden, Eden. So... Now I want you to get this. When the serpent comes in and has a conversation with Eve, who has dominion in the garden? Satan or Adam and Eve? Thank you. Thank you, all the scholars in the room. Now this is extremely important. Satan, Satan does not have dominion in the garden. Adam and Eve has dominion in the garden. At this point, when the, when the serpent enters the garden, Adam and Eve is still under God's authority, which means that they are in authority. Now watch how it works. Because Satan doesn't have dominion in the garden, he simply just can't come into the garden and overpower Adam and Eve. So guess what he's got to do? He's got to show them and convince them because the truth is he doesn't have more authority than Adam and Eve. So the only thing he can do now, he needs to try to manipulate Adam and Eve, manipulate by the power or the weapon of deception to convince Eve to question the truth that God had spoken. I'm going somewhere. When he got Eve to question the truth of God's word, it is then she took it to the next level and she behaves in a manner that dishonors God, which causes her to lose her authority. See, to get you to destroy your life, Satan has got you, got to get you to a place where you believe what God said is not true. And look what he does to Eve. He sowed the seed of deception in Eve's field, and because she didn't do what she should have done, it disrupts the whole plan and the system that God has put in place. What are you saying, Bishop? I'm saying this, that when we let the enemy deceive us, he will come in and sow seed in your mind, in your life, and in the world around you, and he will destroy everything that God has planned for you because you, my friends, are deceived. 
Now watch this. So here comes the important question. If we need to learn from this, what should have Eve done? Eve's mistake in this story is not found, by the way, in the giving of the fruit to Adam. But it's found in the mismanagement of her conversation with the serpent. Family, what if I told you that you are losing your fight with the enemy, not because he is more powerful than you, but rather it's because you believe his lies more than God's truth. Let me say it again. You cannot win the fight against your enemy when you believe lies over God's truth. Eve's mistake in the garden was not even that she spoke to the serpent. But it is the fact that she mismanages the conversation. The moment Satan sowed a seed of doubt in Eve's mind that God's word could not be trusted, she should have immediately ended the conversation. But she did, or she does, or she did what most of us do. We engage the conversation. And because we engage the conversation, she, because she listens, she considers what Satan said as truth. Some of you are losing the fight in your life, not because you don't have the power to win, but rather it's because you're carrying on conversations and listening to suggestions of someone who's trying to deceive you to take your focus off God. Let me tell you how deceived we are. We are so deceived because we've listened to the enemy that now in our world, the enemy has told us that if you're a man, you're not really a man, you could be a woman. If you're a woman, you're not really a woman, you could be a man because you don't know. And what happens is now we've got a whole group of people that's being raised and some people even within the church who don't know if they're male or they're female, but God still says in his book that he created them male and female. So, so watch this, church. When you, when you buy into deception, it's okay. If you want to be a man and you want, if you're a man and you say you want to be a woman, then that's okay. I guess that's your choice. But don't say that it's normal because according to the beginning and according, according to the book, it's not normal. Do you understand? Just say, I guess I'm deceived. Oh, look at you feeling so uncomfortable. But one of the things we need to understand, church, one of the things we need to understand about spiritual warfare is don't try to negotiate with the enemy. <laughs> and I love it. Please say it even louder than that. But, but, but we do it all the time. We do it. We're doing it in church. We're great organizations who, were, who was raised on the power of Pentecost is now reexamining. Do you know, I just heard last week, Oh, I didn't fact check it, so I don't know if I should say it. I won't say it. And I know some of you are disappointed, but no, I shouldn't say it. But I really want to say it, but I won't say it, okay? But you've got to be careful, church, that you, that you don't allow your, your enemy to engage you in a conversation where he deceives you because once deception comes into your life, you will start, you will start behaving in a way that dishonors God. When you dishonor God in your life, it brings chaos. Oh, Jesus, help me today. I'm telling you, church, some of you are struggling in your life and you're asking God, you're saying, God, what's wrong? But God's saying, listen to me, you're off course. You've got to come back and get on course. You've got to line up to what I said in the book. We've got to stop trying to change the book to fit us, but we've got to change us to fit the book because that's just the way it's going to be, church. We don't have the power to change us. We've got to come back to the word of God. If the enemy can convince you that you are something that you are not, it will cause massive confusion in your life. Now, I want you to get this. I'm almost done. Satan is a master deceiver. And his name is not Rico, by the way. He is a master deceiver. 
And he's, watch this, watch this. And he's a master negotiator. And the only way to combat a lie is with truth. And if you study the Bible, you're going to discover that Satan always uses the same strategy. In the same strategy, Satan, the same strategy that Satan used against, against Eve, he tries to use the same strategy with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 after Jesus has fasted 40 days and 40 nights. The strategy he used with Eve and the strategy he tries to use with Jesus was the same, but the outcome was very different. So now let's learn from Jesus. When Satan tempted Eve, Eve believed the lie of Satan rather than the truth of God. But when Satan tempts Jesus, Satan took the word of God and he tried to manipulate and twist the word of God. But Jesus now takes it and he uses the truth of God's word to fight and to destroy the lie of the enemy. See, Satan wants us to believe a lie. But we must come in no other name but the name of Jesus, and we must command that we are not going to have conversations with the enemy where he can get inside of our field. Ah, Jesus. We've got, and I know this may seem old-fashioned, but we've got to concentrate our mind. We've got, to, we've got to put it underneath the blood of Jesus. We've got to sanctify our mind. We've got to say, I'm not going to think on those things. I'm not going to listen to the enemy that I know only has one desire for me, and that is to kill me. If you knew that somebody sitting beside you had one go in life, which was to kill you. Can I have my uh, cloth there, somebody? Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm almost done. Even, now I'm starting to sweat. I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Do you know there was a time that preachers thought that unless you sweat your clothes, <laughs> that you weren't really anointed? So, so I guess now I'm just getting anointed because I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> Where was I? Where was I? Yes, I was I was I was talking about oh we, we must come against we must come against the deception with and through the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I cannot, ladies and gentlemen, defeat the enemy in our own strength. We must come in somebody else's authority who has more authority than I, and that's where Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we don't have to fight our battle on our own. We don't have to engage the enemy once the enemy starts to try to sow seed of doubt in our in our lives, in our spirit, in our feel that the word of God is not true. What we've got to do is end the conversation. Do you ever have a conversation with somebody and you thought, you know what, I just need to end this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just tell some people, stop, conversation over. Because let me tell you something, when it comes to your enemy, stop trying to negotiate with your enemy. He is far wiser than you and you cannot negotiate with the enemy of your soul and win. It is absolutely impossible. Praise team, you guys can come on out. If you come out, I'll close. If they don't come out, I'm not going to close. So everybody say, come on out, praise team. Listen to what 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says. The Amplified Bible says this. For the God of this world has blinded the unbeliever's mind that they should not discern the truth, preventing them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the Messiah, who is the image and likeness of God. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 6 says this in IV version. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. It says this. Do you know that the unrighteous and the wrongdoer will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be 
Come on, do not what? Do not be deceived or misled. Neither the impure. Now it's going to talk about who's not going to be in heaven. Neither is the impure and immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulteries, nor those who participate in homosexuality. Not my word, it's God's word. That's God's word. Family deception, thank you for your overwhelming applause. Family deception always betrays those who live in it. James 1.22 says, I've read it before, be you what doers of the word and not just listeners of the word. The only way to avoid the spirit of deception, the only way, it's not, the only way is not come to church. The only way is that you would know the word of God. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, in John 17, verse 17, Jesus prays to the Father, and this is what he says. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There's a famine in the land, but it's not a famine of shortage of food. It's a famine of the word of God. We have, we, you and I, I'm talking about you and I as church people, so few people know hardly anything about the Word of God these days. And in this verse, Jesus communicates two very important facts. Number one, he's saying that God's Word is truth. In other words, God's Word equals truth. And number two, it's by truth, that is God's Word that God sanctify, sanctifies us and sets us apart. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not sanctified just because you come to a church. You are not sanctified just because you tune in and watch your favorite preacher, which I hope it's me. But you're not sanctified. You're not born again just because you tune in online. I'm even going to take one step further. You're not sanctified and you're not even simply born again just because you pray. You, the only way that you can be truly be born again is by making sure that you pray the right prayer. That's the prayer of repentance. That is recognizing that you are a sinner which everyone, all, all of the wonderful, amazing people that impress you in this church, Every one of us had to go through this. And your bishop or your pastor or your friend named Dave, whatever I am to you, I got to go through it every single day. There is not a day that goes by where I don't put myself under the blood of Jesus Christ, asking him, God, if I've sinned, if there was a crack in the door, if somehow the enemy crept in. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, don't give the enemy a foothold. You know what that means? You know what a foothold is. You, your, your wife is mad at you and she slams the door, but you put your foot in the door to leave a crack open. Don't give, what it means is don't give the devil any occasion. Don't give him any opportunity. Don't allow him to come and plant seeds of doubt in your mind. But do whatever you've got to do to make a decision. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to lean on God. I'm, listen, most of us. Most, a lot of us, a lot of us, not most of us, a lot of us in this church is grieving. There's a lot of us that's confused. We don't understand why Pastor Peter Moncrief, I got to say Pastor Peter because there's two Pastor Peters. Pastor Peter Moncrief passed away. We don't understand that, but we can't, we can't, we got to make sure that the door, the crack is not left open because when you leave a crack open in your life, the enemy will come in Why the people are sleeping and sow seeds. And they will grow and you can look at my life and you can look at your own life and you can see what kind of seed has been sowed by seeing what's going on in your life 
And today, here it is, I'm, I'm done, here it is. I'm telling you, church, if you're tired of the enemy sowing bad seed and then coming back and convincing you that it was God that sowed the bad seed, I'm telling you, today, that can stop in your life. It just requires a decision. Today, as adults, especially if you're a believer, today, as believers, if you're going to lie, you got to think about it. Because lie, lying to the true believer is no longer natural. It goes against your spirit. I'm telling you, church, there's some, sometimes, sometimes the cashier has given me back too much money. And I've got to make a decision. I've got to make a decision. I've got to think about it. Do I just walk away with the cashier and say, I'm sorry? Or another case that you didn't charge, especially at restaurants. Sometimes this happens to us. Don't know if it happens to you that they forget to put something on the menu or on the, on the bill. And my wife was like, the devil is like, no, no, she didn't say that. She just says, no, she forgot something. If she forgot it on purpose or he forgot it on purpose, that's one thing. But we need to bring it to their attention. Excuse me, ma'am. You forgot to put our appetizer. Do you, do, you, do you understand? Because in order for us to not do that, what we're doing is we're allowing a crack. Anybody remember living back in the day when we had gates? I mean, gates in our house, right? You had a fence and, and, and mom would tell you, dad would tell you, don't go past the gate. And especially if you had a dog, they would, some people know what I'm talking about. Listen, don't leave the gate open. If you were born and raised in Newfoundland or the West Indies, you got licks for leaving the gates open. Serious licks. <laughs> Serious licks. And your parents would tell you, close the gate. But God is sending your bishop, your friend, your pastor here today to tell this church, to remind every person that's online, close the gate. Close the ear gate, the mouth gate, the eye gate, whatever gates that's left open in your life that's causing the enemy to come in and say, listen, I, I'm telling you, church, whatever decision you've got to make, regardless of the consequences, it might be financial decisions, but if you want the blessings of God flowing freely in your life, you've got to close the gate. Somebody shout, close the gate. Stand to your feet, slap three people a high five, and tell them, close the gate.